Hello, this is Pastor Patrick Hines, and we are live uh, today. I want to talk today about a, a, a subject that is um, very important to me on a personal level uh, because it's biblical and it's uh, precious to me. <clears throat> and it is the fact that Scripture teaches us that what motivates the Christian life, what motivates our obedience to God, our, our attempts to obey His commandments, to walk in His ways, uh, to worship him well is gratitude and it's a gratitude uh, for the work of jesus christ it's gratitude for um, the cross gratitude and thankfulness to god uh, for all that he has done for us in his son and sending him into the world to suffer and die for our sins and it's a vital truth it's an absolutely vital truth um, that we uh, need to understand, we need to embrace, we need to believe, um, we need to um, defend this truth. Um, as as always, it's under attack. And one of the problems uh, that we face is the unregenerate world cannot understand that gratitude would be enough to motivate someone to live a godly life. The world around us cannot get that, just cannot understand that. Because if you don't know Christ, if you're an unbeliever, what else would motivate you to be good except trying to save yourself? What is the motivation to be good in Roman Catholicism? Your own salvation. What is the motivation to be good in all forms of neonomian legalism, every false gospel that's out there today uh, in the world and being circulated? <clears throat> what is the motivating force behind obedience? Trying to save yourself. When we first moved to Tennessee, uh, I don't know how the Jehovah's Witnesses um, do this, but somehow they know if you if you just moved uh, to the area, and I think five pairs of Jehovah's Witnesses over the, the first four or five years that we lived here uh, kept showing up at our door. And uh, the last uh, time that happened, it was actually, it was not a, um, it wasn't a pair of them. It was just one guy, which was um, a little bit unusual because usually they, they go out in twos, but he was all by himself. He was an older fellow. He's probably in his fifties. And um, <clears throat> while he was doing his, his thing, I was trying to be you know, polite. It was early on a Saturday morning and I was standing there on my front porch with him. And I decided to try an approach I'd never tried before. And I asked him the question, why are you out here? And he, he kind of said, he, he wasn't really sure what I, what I was asking. What do, you, what do you mean? Why am I out here? And I, I asked him, what motivates you? What motivates you to knock on doors and to do uh, everything that you're doing right now? And trying to proselytize people to be Jehovah's Witnesses. What what motivates this? And he said it was about securing his place in paradise. And I pointed out to him, in other words, in other words, you're not here because you care about me, are you? You're not here because you care about my neighbors whose doors you've been knocking on. You're here for one reason. You. You knock on doors and talk to people, not because you care about them, not because you love them, but because you care about yourself and you love yourself. And I was able to share the gospel with him. I said, let me tell you about what it is to know the one true God and to be motivated to love people, not out of fear or trying to save myself or as one one individual or faith in future grace that he'll keep sanctifying me and eventually make me sanctified enough to get into heaven it's not that what motivates me to love my neighbors to love my wife to love my children to love my church is gratitude thankfulness i'm not trying to save myself other people are not objects through which I gain merit for myself by doing good to them. As a Christian, as someone who really understands the grace of God, I can love people simply because they're made in God's image and because I'm thankful that the Lord Jesus Christ saved me. 
in the Westminster Confession of Faith, chapter 16.2. That chapter is on good works. Very important chapter. It says, these good works done in obedience to God's commandments are the fruits and evidences of a true and lively faith. And by them, believers manifest their thankfulness. And it goes on and strengthen, strengthen their assurance, edify their brethren, adorn the profession of the gospel, stop the mouths of adversaries and glorify God whose workmanship they are created in Christ Jesus thereunto. So good works in the life of a Christian are done by the Christian to manifest their thankfulness. They will thank thankfulness for what? For the grace of God by which we're saved. When I think about my life, when I think about why I get up in the morning and why I'm able to persevere through incredible heartache and persevere through the trials and the tribulations and the difficulties that we experience in life. What motivates that? Why do I get up and I think I've got to, I've got to love my wife. What motivates that is not, I better do that or I'm not going to go to heaven. I better do that or I might not be finally saved. No. Why do I need to love my wife? Because Jesus died for me. Because God loved me and gave himself for me. Jesus loved me and gave himself for me at the cross. He took the punishment of my sins, all of them, at the cross and has taken them away, having nailed them to the cross, and I bear the guilt of them no more. So by my good works, I'm not trying to get myself saved or finally saved or maintain my salvation. I'm manifesting my thankfulness that my salvation's a done deal. I'm manifesting my thankfulness that God, by one act of justification, has accepted me as righteous in his sight, not for anything wrought in me, not because of any sanctifying work he's done in me, not for anything done by me, not because of any good works that I do, but only for the righteousness of Jesus Christ, imputed, credited legally to my account in God's heavenly accounting book, and received by me by faith alone meaning not by works. To believe in Jesus means I do not believe in my works anymore. And you think, okay, so once a person is born again and saved and justified before God and is justified, is on their way to heaven, well, if they live for a while longer before they die and go to heaven, what are they supposed to do with their life? Their whole life is to be a sacrifice of praise to God. The whole rest of their life is to be a sacrifice of praise to God. And as I've said, the unregenerate mind out there cannot understand that. Just cannot understand that gratitude is what motivates personal holiness. Because the only motivation that they could ever think of that would motivate someone to be good, to, to resist temptation to sin, and to maintain holiness, it would have to be selfish. It's got to be about me and my own salvation. It's got to be about me having a better afterlife. But for a Christian, that's not what motivates their personal holiness. That's not what motivates them to be obedient to God's commandments. What motivates a Christian is thankfulness, is gratitude to God for his grace and for his forgiveness. That's the thing that the world around us just just does not get. It just does not understand that. The only reasonable response to being saved by the grace of Almighty God is to give the rest of your life in this world as a living sacrifice of thanksgiving to God. What, what else could we do? What else could we do? It's like we were we were drowning in, in the lake and we're gonna die. Actually, the biblical illustration would be we already died. Jesus dives into the lake, swims to the bottom, pulls us off the bottom where we're dead, resurrects us, brings us ashore, dries us off, and then we see what we once were, and we see the life we've been delivered from. What else can we do but fall to our knees and be thankful? You know, when someone gives you a gift for Christmas or for your birthday, 
if you pull out your wallet, try to give them some money for it, if they accept that money, is it a gift then? No. The moment you try to pay for it, it's not a gift. What does the Bible say about salvation? What does it say about eternal life? Romans 6, 20, 23. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. If I work for it, if I do something thinking that's going to get it for me or get eternal life for me by doing that, then it's not a gift, is it? So why do we, we want to live a Christian life then? Why do we want to be godly? Why does a Christian want to please God in their life? Why do they do that? <clears throat> to show their thankfulness. Psalm 116 verse 12 says, What shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits toward me? What shall I, what shall I do for the Lord? For all of his benefits towards me. I have forgiveness, full forgiveness of every sin I ever will commit in my life. Up to the point of my death. They're already all forgiven. That's one of his benefits. He forgives all your iniquities. I have the righteousness of Jesus Christ in my legal account before God. And I stand clothed in that divine righteousness before God. No charge of sin will ever be brought against me. I have God as my father. I can refer to the creator of heaven and earth. I can bow my head. In fact, I can do it without bowing my head. I can talk to the God of all creation anywhere I am. And I have the privilege of a private audience with him anywhere I am in the world. I have God's promise that if this earthly tent is destroyed, my body, when it dies, I have a tent in the heavens. I have a home in the heavens not made with hands. Eternal in that place. Jesus has gone to prepare a place. For us, he will not leave us orphans. He prayed in John 17, 24 to his father. I pray that they may be with me where I am. That they may behold my glory. That is going to happen. I have that too. And I think Psalm 116, 12, what a great question. What shall I render to the Lord for all of his benefits toward me? How do I show thanksgiving? For that, for those gifts that he's given me, those benefits that he's freely given to me with no regard or reference to my works at all. The next verse, Psalm 116, verse 13. I will take up the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. I'm going to worship God because I'm thankful. Second Corinthians 4, 15 Paul wrote, for all things are for your sakes, that grace, having spread through the many, may cause thanksgiving to abound to the glory of God. Grace, what is, and what is grace? It is the favor of God on account of Christ. Grace causes gratitude. And what does a person who is truly grateful and has gratitude in their heart towards God, what do they do? They call upon the Lord. They walk in his commandments. They love God by walking in his commandments. I want to read just a few uh, questions and answers from part three of the Heidelberg Catechism. Um, the Heidelberg Catechism is one of those great, wonderful, Reformation symbols of the Christian faith that's used by the Continental Reformed Church, the Christian Reformed Church, the United Reformed Church uses it as their doctrinal statement, as one of their doctrinal statements. <clears throat> the third part of it um, is called gratitude. The first two are guilt and grace. Guilt, grace, gratitude. Why is that catechism divided under those three headings? Well, the first heading, guilt, shows us our sin and misery. How do we learn about our sin and misery? Uh, from the law of God. The standard is too high. We can't meet it. To love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength and our neighbor as ourselves. there's nobody that does that. The Ten Commandments, which are summarized as the two great commandments to love God, love neighbor, we all fall short of the standard in that way. So we see 
our sin <clears throat> and our misery. So that's guilt. Grace, how we are delivered from our sin and misery. God has unconditionally elected out of the mass of fallen humanity, a multitude of people so vast no one can count them, and gave them to Jesus Christ before time began, it says in 2 Timothy 1, 9, I believe it is, and Ephesians chapter 1, John 6, 37 through 39, Romans chapters 8 and 9, God predestined us um, to adoption as sons, God chose us before the foundation of the world, um, God is the one who does this, and in the fullness of time, Jesus Christ comes into the world with that divine mission, and he saves his people from their sins and delivers them. And in time, they are effectually called, united to Jesus Christ. And then they are justified before God. <clears throat> and they are saved entirely and completely and only by the grace of God. And the sole instrument of our justification is not baptism, our good works, our faithfulness. It's faith in Christ. What is faith in Christ? It's the opposite of faith in works. If you believe in Jesus, that means you don't believe in your works. It means, what are you relying on to get into heaven? What Christ did. And to do that, you can't be relying upon yourself or your works or anything that you've done. You can't. And if you do, to any extent at all, Christ will be of no benefit to you. In Romans 4, 15 and 16, for the law brings about wrath. The law brings about wrath. Therefore, verse 16, therefore, justification is by faith, not by law keeping. It's by faith so that it would be by grace. How do I get to heaven? I rely on the finished work of Christ alone. That's what faith is. It is personal reliance upon the finished work of Christ alone to get us into heaven. Once I understand that, and I am resting on the finished work of Christ and only on the finished work of Christ. Question 86 of the Heidelberg Catechism then asks, since then we are delivered from our misery merely of grace through Christ without any merit of ours. Why must we still do good works? Answer, because Christ, having redeemed and delivered us by his blood, also renews us by his Holy Spirit after his own image so that we may testify by the whole of our conduct, our gratitude to God for his blessings, and that he may be praised by us. Also, that everyone may be assured in himself of his faith by the fruits thereof, and that by our godly conversation, others may be gained to Christ. Okay, so we do good works to show our thankfulness to God. What shall I render to the Lord for all this, for all these benefits, for these wonderful things that Christ has achieved by his life, death, burial, and resurrection? What, what do I do in response to this? I live my life in obedience to God's commandments. And the Heidelberg Catechism goes guilt, grace, gratitude. The section on gratitude is its exposition of the Ten Commandments. Here is how I show my gratitude to God. This is how I show my gratitude to God, by Walking in his ways, by obeying his commandments, by hating sin, by struggling to be more holy, be more godly. I'm not trying to save myself and go out witnessing. We don't do that for ourselves, like the Jehovah's Witness. Why does the Jehovah's Witness go knock on doors? Utterly, utterly self-centered. He's doing that for him. She's doing that for herself. She not, doesn't care about you at all. That was such an incredible thing, that conversation. I said, why are you doing all this? Why do you go out here and knock on people's doors? Because I want this for myself. I want to make sure I go to paradise. I'm like, so you don't care, care about me, do you? You don't care about me. This is for you. It was such a blessing to be able to tell them. Let me tell you about knowing the true God and living a life where you love people out of thankfulness to him. Let me tell you about this. He'd never heard of anything like that. I had witness to a guy, a Roman Catholic guy, an extended family member in Ohio um, a few years ago at Christmas time. And uh, he said, yeah, I haven't been to mass in a long time. And yeah, I should probably go. I need to get some good Catholic guilt, get myself back in order. And I, I said the same thing to him. I said, can you imagine being motivated to live a godly life out of thankfulness instead of guilt? And he looked at me like, what? I said, yeah. 
I said, brother, my friend, he's not my brother, but friend, I do what I do. I want to be a good husband. I want to love my children. I want to love the church. I want to be sexually pure and chaste. I want to manage my money well. I want to work hard at my calling because I'm thankful to Jesus Christ because he saved me. What motivates me to be good is not fear. It's not me trying to save myself. It's gratitude for the finished work of Jesus Christ. And I'll never forget, he looked at me and said and said these words, I have never heard anything like that in my life. <laughs> I thought, yeah, the, the nominal Catholicism that dominates Cincinnati, it's just pure works righteousness. You know, you just need to go get some good Catholic guilt. Um, so anyway, so all things are for your sakes, that grace having spread through the many may cause thanksgiving to abound to the glory of God. The next question, question 87, cannot they then be saved who continuing in their wickedness and ungrateful lives are not converted to God? By no means. For the Holy Scripture declares that no one chaste person, idolater, adulterer, thief, covetous man, drunkard, slanderer, robber, or any such like shall inherit the kingdom of God. It is impossible for a true Christian to continue in sin that grace may abound. Will they struggle with sin? Oh yeah, that's what Romans 7 is about. But can they continue as the slaves of sin? No, because being converted to God, they've been liberated from sin. <clears throat> Question 88. Of how many parts does the true conversion of man consist? Answer, of two parts, of the mortification of the old and the quickening of the new man. That comes right out of Ephesians chapter 4, uh, verses 22 to 24. Um, that we put off the old man um, with it, that is growing, uh, that is corrupted by deceitful lusts, etc., etc. And you put on the new man that was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness, it says. Okay. What is the mortification of the old man? Answer, it is a sincere sorrow of heart that we have provoked God by our sins and more and more to hate and flee from them. I want to encourage you when you struggle with sin, and as I know you do, if you're a believer, you're going to struggle with sin. Pray, pray that God would give you a hatred of sin. I remember coming to that moment, uh, it was probably 20, 19, 20, and just realizing, you know what the big problem is? The problem is I don't hate sin as much as I should. I still like it. I still love it in some ways and started praying, God, give me an affection for you, for righteousness, and give me a hatred of sin. Lord, help me hate sin. Question 90, what is the quickening of the new man? It is a sincere joy of heart in God through Christ and with love and delight to live according to the will of God in all good works. Great, great answer. Great answer. Now think about Romans chapter 12, uh, verses 1 and 2. I love this, this uh, chapter. I've been quoting this frequently as I, as I preach. Uh, Paul says, I beseech you therefore by the mercies of God, or in view of the mercies of God. In other words, in view of the 11 chapters of doctrine I just gave you about the wrath of God being revealed, about the sinfulness of man, about God's justifying act in the hearts of his people, and the struggles of the Christian life, um, but there's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, and God is sovereign in salvation. In light of all these truths, now that you hopefully are well grounded in the gospel, you understand that we, we trust only in the finished work of Christ and nothing else, present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. That's your reasonable response to the mercy of God. So all the way through scripture, what motivates obedience? Gratitude. When G.C. Burkauer, a reformed uh, theologian, uh, made the statement that if, if grace is the essence of salvation, if grace is the essence of, of theology, then gratitude is the essence of ethics. There's a lot of false doctrine. There's a lot of false gospels out there today that are an over course correction to the charge of antinomianism. Now, what is antinomianism? Antinomianism is the idea that once a person's saved, they have no obligation of any kind to live a godly life. 
And that's not true. We do have an obligation to live a godly life, and we will make those beginning steps of obedience, but we are not saved by them. And those steps of new obedience in no way, shape, or form contribute to us getting into heaven or, or anything of the kind. They don't at all. Antinomianism is a real problem. It's a real problem, especially where I live here in the Bible Belt, where everybody everybody here pretty much professes to be a Christian. And yet, what do you do with people that profess to be Christians, but they, they show no fruit? There's no desire for discipleship. There's no hunger for worship. There's no longing for the word of God. There's no apparent desire for communion with fellow believers or, or anything like that. Um, what do you do uh, with those people? How do you address that? Unfortunately, for many um, who bring up the very same problem I'm talking about, they will hinge final salvation on fruit. They will destroy the gospel and turn it back into law and say, see, we're not antinomians because we think we're saved in some way by our works. That's not the answer. That's not the answer to the problem of antinomianism. The answer is regeneration. The answer is, as the Heidelberg Catechism very eloquently pointed out, that God doesn't merely redeem and deliver us from the curse and justify us and give us eternal life and justify us legally. He also renews us by the Holy Spirit. Every person that is redeemed will be renewed by the Holy Spirit after God's image so that we may testify by the whole of our conduct, our gratitude to God for his blessings. Think of 1 Corinthians 6.20. For you were bought with a price, therefore glorify God with your body. In light of grace, show gratitude to God. In light of the fact that you were, were purchased by the price of the blood of Jesus, glorify God in the in the way that you conduct yourself and the way that you live in your spirit, which are God's first Peter two verse nine is another key passage. First Peter two, nine, you are a chosen generation, a Royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who once were not a people, but now are the people of God who had not obtained mercy but now have obtained mercy. Beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul, having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. And so what is the purpose for which we are made a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people? so that we can proclaim the praises of him who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. Grace causes gratitude. Gratitude motivates obedience. It's not faith in future grace. It's not fear. It's not hoping to bear enough fruit to be finally saved or anything like that. What motivates holiness in the life of a believer is gratitude to God for his grace. Always remember that. 2 Corinthians 4.15. We'll, we'll stop here. 2 Corinthians 4.15. It's such a, a beautiful passage of scripture. Grace causes the giving of thanks. Grace causes that, that term charis in Greek. Greek, Greek. Grace causes thanksgiving, eucharistion, to abound to the glory of God. Grace gives birth to gratitude. Gratitude causes the glory of God to be manifested in our lives by our obedience to God. The non-believers of the world can't get that. How could thankfulness be the sole motivating force for your obedience? No, it's got to be selfish. No, the, the Jehovah's Witness is right. It, the, the only reason that you love your neighbor is you're trying to, to pile up more points to get yourself into heaven. A true believer, we understand this perfectly. Why do I want to please God and obey him and love my wife, love my church? Why do I want to be faithful to, to my marriage, even in my private thought life? Why do I want to be 
uh, godly in the way I interact with people? Why do I want to manage money, you know, faithfully, accurately? Why do I want to make sure that I look out for the good of others? Thankfulness, guilt, grace, gratitude. That's what motivates obedience. Neonomians, people that add works in some way to what saves us. Legalists, purveyors of false gospels that teach justification by faithfulness or works in some way. We'll never understand that. What Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 4.15 will always be lost on them. They will not understand what he means by that. Grace, having spread through the many, would cause the giving of thanks to abound the glory of God. Grace causes gratitude. Gratitude is what motivates our love for God and love for neighbor. At no point as a Christian am I ever motivated by trying to save myself. And in fact, the moment that I would be motivated by that would destroy, would destroy the, the good works I'm doing. If they're selfishly motivated, which all of man's religions lead to utter selfishness, then in what possible way could they be pleasing to God? It's only when we understand his grace, rest upon the finished work of Christ, and understand true thanksgiving. You see, you can't, you, you never really will be holy until you've been set free. That's what, that's the parallel. People really think, the Reformation said this to the Reformers, the Arminians said this to the Reformed, the Pelagians said this to Augustine. Man, if you tell people it's a free gift and their works have nothing to do with it, they're going to live like pigs. They're going to live like dogs. Because they didn't understand. They didn't understand. God saves someone and changes their heart. They will want to live a godly life. Augustine said that. When you're saved, once you're saved, you can do anything you want. Go do whatever you want. Question is, what do you want to do? If you're a true, a true believer, you will want to please God. You will want to show your gratitude. You will want to be sexually pure. You will want to manage your money well. You'll want to have a good family. You'll want to have integrity in your dealings with people. You'll want to tell the truth. You'll want to be content with what you have. And see, that's the thing missing. From all the false gospels, all the insertions of works and fruit and everything, all the other stuff going on today, they really do think that's the answer to easy believism. That the antinomian impulse that, yeah, I walked an aisle, prayed a prayer, and I don't go to church, and I live with my girlfriend, and I'm a drug dealer, and but I, I prayed the prayer, I, I walked the aisle, I, I'm good to go. The answer to that is, well, you're finally saved by your works, so you're not going to be finally saved. The answer to that is the issue of regeneration. You don't bear any fruit. Then you have no reason to think that that profession of faith is real. But do you all understand the difference, though, between these two statements? It's almost like the whole world around me, around the church today, just cannot get this. Think, think about these two statements. Number one, those that go to heaven do good works. That's the first statement, and that's a true statement. Those that go to heaven do good works. Now, here's this, the next statement. This is the false statement. Those that go to heaven get in there by doing good works. That's a false statement. First statement is true. Those that go to heaven will do good works. The false statement is those that go to heaven get in there by doing good works. Good works accompany salvation. There's a vast difference between saying good works will always accompany salvation and salvation is achieved by good works. Christians understand it's the finished work of Christ alone that saves us. And therefore, what motivates me to be godly is thankfulness. Just as the Holy Spirit said, all things are for your sakes, that grace having spread through the many may cause thanksgiving to abound to the glory of God. So grace doesn't cause fear to abound to the glory of God. Or a selfish desire to bear enough fruit to make it all the way into heaven to abound to the glory of God. Grace causes thanksgiving. Grace causes gratitude. And if grace is the essence of salvation, gratitude is the essence and the sole motivating force for living a godly life and being obedient to God. 
All right, let me see who's over here today. All right, there's Paul Garvey and Micaiah McKenzie. Are you, are you new? Lucy Martinez, Cafe Queen. You've been on there before. Uh, Travis Holmes, God the Son, Jesus Christ saves from Maui. Wow, cool. And Harpazo. Man, repentance is key with all holiness and those who Lord. Harpazo. Isn't that the word for that's translated into the set or the uh, Vulgate as Rappy Amer from First Thessalonians 4? <clears throat> um, about the rapture or something. Anyway, um, thank you all for um uh for watching or for listening. I hope this has been helpful to you. Um, when people decry so many people profess to know the Lord and they just they're just not saved, the answer to that is to preach the reality of the new birth and the changed life. It is not to hinge final salvation on fruit or to insert the law into the gospel in some way. That destroys the gospel and destroys the motivation for living a godly life. What motivates a godly life? Gratitude, not selfishness. Thank you all for watching or for listening.